Once this place was so easy to know, before Michael Brown, before Kate Chopin, before Jonathan Franzen, before William Burroughs, before David R. Francis, before Dr. Leroy Bundy, before Joseph Wingate Folk, before Pontiac commiserated with the French officers at a tavern, before Frankie Freeman was able to whisper to Lyndon Johnson, before Kay Dry and boxes of requested government documents, before Shelley and Kramer, before Charles Guggenheim triumphalized, triumphalized the Gateway Arch, before Minoru Yamasaki gave the city both its celebrated port of entry and its tragic modern symbol, before Nathaniel Lyon contained the Confederate mob, before Harry Turner drowned himself on Christmas Day, before Mary Meacham led runaway slaves across the river to freedom, before the wealthy of the city formed a posse and shot striking streetcar engineers, before Archie Blaine broke on supporting the bulldozing of his own neighborhood, before Robert E. Lee manipulated our river to keep St. Louis alive, before the St. Louis Cardinals fans left their night game at Sportsman's Park to assault black swimmers at Fairgrounds Park, before Joe Edwards built a trolley, before Edgar Queenie set into motion the company capable of developing Agent Orange, before Thomas Stearns Elliott packed his bags, before the Cahokian elite built the palisade to possibly keep out the riffraff, before, 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 before power, empire ever set on this place, before humans, the dream of the river that runs through our city may be freedom from the strange parade of settlement, the tortuous inflicted and inflected presences of people across its high lowlands, but such a condition is unknowable past our future. We are left to dwell in between, staying with the trouble as Donna Haraway counsels. Seems like no choice but a preternatural edict. There's nowhere else to go. So is our in between the Anthropocene. If it is, we may not be any further than we have been since Cahokia arose many centuries ago. We just now carry with us a long European heritage of Puritanism that has not expiated. Sometimes it seems that we chronicle the actions of humans here and across the globe to shame ourselves, as if history is a fundamentally moral construction. History doesn't give a damn about right or wrong. It just gives anybody who does an arsenal of evidence. We look at landscape as evidence in this time, the Anthropocene, or whenever this is. And, and I go with whenever, because I don't think time is as short as a word tethered to the accelerated nomos or habits of, of humans. Perhaps we need to start naming what is about to happen when we look at what already has happened. Landscapes seem urgent or precarious right now, but they're lying. They want us to think they're one thing when in fact they are another. They naturalize records of power and abuse, sending detectives tracking always right back to the present. We call landscapes unstable in this time when in fact they are one of the most stable signifiers that the forces of capitalism, racism, and imperialism have at their disposal. It's easier to shape the land than to change the minds of people or kill them off. The new shape arrests time, abridging the moment between the wound and the healing. Instead, the wounds are dissolved into the junk spaces that few question as evidence of what comes next. Some question as evidence of what came before, and most people reconcile with a view of what comes now that renders any horizon of action invisible. The monuments tell us big lies, so we look closely at the terrain of everyday life. We hit the parking lots, the dying shopping malls, the places between fences, the ghettos, the slag heaps, and the rural fields. Like Orpheus, for a while we won't look behind but ahead at the mundane before we turn around and render the mundane also a monument a frozen and dead thing. Every coincidence tempts us with the lure of significance. This lure dampens time, flattens it into a circle. We arrive only where we start. 
The Dead End Block, near where a famous musician had his first house in the middle of an urban renewal project, three blocks from a big this and not far from a that, and you know what that has to mean. But do we? Do we know anything at all when we make such surmises, or are we feebly lurching toward pattern recognition or brains instilled because the thing worse than death always is to be completely lost? Maybe being lost, though, is not so bad after all. Being found seems pretty dull. Their Instagram feeds devoting to so many aspects of ordinary landscapes that the photographs sometimes seem to be images not of actual places, but other images, or at least influences. Skidding by at a 30 second view, if that, they signify only what we can already envision them to signify, because we aren't inhabiting the images, let alone the subjects they present. Mass media kills us by making us tourists. How do we break the flat plane of time and move past naming it before we actually change history? Bruno Latour recently directed us, actors in the throes of an epic we want to call the Anthropocene. He says, what to do? First of all, generate alternative descriptions. I propose that we describe what places do instead of what they are. Somewhere in the new descriptions may be glimpses into the future, into a time when a new set of relations is possible or becoming. If the agony of our landscapes is a sense that they record things that we don't want, we must locate the record of the things that we do want. Or we risk die trying. A noble death, of course. <laughs> Pollution is knowledge. The Mississippians left us a record of shit. The most real source of discovery about the declination of Cahokia may come through fecal stannels that archaeologists are now investigating. Hard evidence may break years of soft speculation against an empiric horizon. So far, fecal evidence suggests the Cahokia population declined after flooding and other events yet completely understood. The Mississippians, we know, defecated outdoors, and their droppings often ended up draining toward Horseshoe Lake's watershed. Decades of examining the less phenal aspects of Cahokia may not have been as instructive in understanding how the first city here died completely. The archaeologists found that the stanal density rises from 600 to about 1100 common era but declines from 1,200 to 1,400. 500 years in, 200 years out. St. Louis, by comparison, had 190 years in, and now is either 70 years out or 70 years flatlined if you look at city or city and county. 800 years from now, what stuff that we have dumped will show anybody that our city was declined? We can look backward toward St. Louis's Chateau Pond, an occlusion of the Mill Creek made by a French miller whose new pond became both the recreational grounds of a parkless city and the destination for shunted human waste. How the Euro-Americans, who also sent their ship to a body of water, could judge any indigenous North American inhabitants as savage suggests possible mental illness. <laughs> Today we send ours into a river, into a gulf, into an ocean. Is this what the Marxists call accelerationism? The waste sent to Shoto's Pond ultimately killed at least 4,285 people through cholera in 1849. At that time, the city still lacked municipal sewerage systems, although they soon would be built. The city's response was to drain the pond, and the drain lowland soon was sold off to newly capitalized railroads needing lines through the city. 100 years after, and civilization in St. Louis progresses enough to match the last century's shit with blood. When the city's park commissioner unilaterally and hastily decided to integrate swimming pools to all humans in June 1949, the opening day of the pool fairground park ended in the first and only race ride confined to the city limits of St. Louis, asterisk, 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 lots of footnotes there. Anxiety over the future of North St. Louis spurred white people to attack black swimmer, swimmers and even white police officers who attempted to enforce what laws actually existed. Blood on the ground, blood on the hands of the white people who would abandon the pool and the park and the entire half of the city in short order. Did they take that blood with them? The riot ended with official blame on both white and black people. A door closed on the pollution of racial violence for a generation. When we claim that East St. Louis or North St. Louis is precarious, do we also mean that Ledoux or Clayton or St. Charles now is far too gone, past precarity? 
Because I want to follow the blood from those hands, those lunatic minds, not badger the descendants of the people who showed up just to swim. Those who showed up to kill bother me more. The ultimate wormhole in St. Louis may be the possibly smoldering isotopes of the Manhattan Project waves tucked into the West Lake landfill. You all know this. We need a new concept of time to even think through what this waste can do to our settlement. Deep time, not cheap time. Deep time forces us to think through a future of emergency declaration, forced evacuation, and harmful contamination that could outlive any current form of government existing here. If the waste's worst fate means that our current mentality is inadequate, its best fate, removal and some voluntary resettlement, makes it someone else's problem in a different place and on a different time scale. Perhaps property is the worst form of pollution. Tracing the root of property back to Latin, to one's own, we may find that the only real estate in the world is our blood and our shit and a bunch of other things. Yet many people think it's land owned, and we have bent the land to accommodate a multiplication of parcels and houses. Parcels and houses. No one can exonerate any part of the region by picking on another either. The code of private property arrived with French colonists, perfected in the hands of urban elites, and ended up building Newtown or Wildwood. We can call part of the system exotic, but that's also like letting a snowflake land on your tongue and claiming it's the entire weather pattern. <laughs> St. Louis's early 20th century proliferation of capitalized land benefited in part from an import-export relation with the great Southwest, Texas, <laughs> Oklahoma, and Arkansas. Finished goods in equity went out, while bauxite lead, cotton, livestock, and petroleum landed northeast on St. Louis controlled railroad lines for processing here. No finer memorial to St. Louis's trade may exist than the remaining chaff piles that form a toxic heartland version of Monument Valley in Pitcher, Oklahoma. Pitcher has become an uninhabitable super fun site with each headwind thick with tailings dust. The mines closed as their surplus value declined and the St. Louis investors retreated without reparation. Much of the chat now forms road pavement, which breaks down. More dust. Someone breathes that too. Why the River City never learned to revere dust eludes explanation. The entire central city was destroyed by dust in 1849. The metonymic steamer White Cloud sent aloft a discharge of smoldering ash, a common atmospheric aspect to that city. The discharge sent the boat on fire before flames left onto other steamboats, raw goods, roofs, and wagons. Dust to dust. The fire ended when volunteer firefighters used black gunpowder to detonate buildings along a firewall. One of them, Captain Thomas Targi, blew himself to kingdom come but ended the conflagration. The fire proved fortuitous and allowed for the capitalization of new cast iron-faced modern warehouses along the city's aged waterfront. Eventually, these would be smashed to dust to build the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial at the same time when bituminous coal banished the rising sun from the city for weeks on end. Then the city would manically rush to render entire neighborhoods dust. Eventually, too, as landlords sought to abandon worthless houses in North City in the white flight era, they would turn them into dust through fire, and the dust converted to cash through insurance settlements. Nowadays, the fires continue, but they don't have an exchange value. They just consume. Usually nothing replaces these buildings. The dust presumably settles somewhere, much of it in our organs, whether we like it or not, so that the artifacts of a long past speak through our ragged breath and our altered vocal pitch when dust exits us. No landscape element is anything but an arrow toward another, usually somewhere very far away. No element is a solid mark except in the now. It, the then and the later, it's liquid, it's transitory, it's our own blood whose constitution links us to billions of people already dead, still alive, and that will be, and that maybe we will never meet or know. Landscape. How, how, how? Knowledge is pollution. Knowledge is power. Bacon, Hobbes, Foucault, you, me. No land has been shaped that has not been known, and rarely has any land been known not to be shaped. Yet landscape always has been a mutuality in production in which the knower is always shaped by the known. Sometimes the knower doesn't want to know this. 
Sometimes encounter produces authority as a primary affect, but ignorance as a secondary effect. St. Louis emanates from a great epistemic system in service to political power, the urban grid. The grid, subject to much urbanist adoration, love the grid, love the grid, love the grid, instantiates power and joins land to human control. Our city's base model is the Roman castrum with or ordinal fixity and an infinitely fungible web that could capture the entire planet's surfaces. In fact, under the pseudonym of the United States Public Land Survey System, it tried. It's a dragnet of statecraft, a matrix of taxable land and governable subjects. The web intrinsically is pollution because it is a mechanism for making private property out of commons, which it did after the original village of St. Louis devoured common fields and conflicting alternate spatial plans. This becomes this. But we're not immune by crossing this river. Here in Granite City, we sit on a grid with diagrid transects, a merger of Roman idealism and house many in pomp. Does the flat plan of the city teach us anything? Certainly. Does it mislead us at the same time? Of course. Missing is what Brian Holmes has termed the cartography of togetherness, a representation of sensory order. We have the lines of surveyors, tax collectors, endorsements of power, but not the aura of place, not the sense of place in this map. No record that Granite City was a vicious sundown town from the moment the surveyors were hired to draw a line. No representation that would show that in 1990, only 69 out of 32,862 residents here were black. Ten years later, in 2000, there were 622 black residents in Granite City. That was just 18 years ago, outside of St. Louis. We're left senseless by what? Eduardo Galeano posits that Europeans still do not know they, where they are in the Americas, that their colonization is a mask hiding a deep ignorance of where they are and who they share the continent with. Perhaps the great university across the river knows something about where it is. With the best minds for miles and a $7.2 billion endowment, the school has no rote excuse for not knowing. In fact, it has spent millions, literally, to uncover the spatial politics of the divided city. So when its retiring chancellor aims for a post-collegiate civic commitment, he chooses to be the titular head and ombudsman for a city-county consolidation drafted in a closet and funded largely by a local oligarch. Knowledge of the landscape, knowledge of the divides all seem to profit someone other than the inhabitants studied most often at this school. Are the scholars just spectate, spectating the trauma of others studying division, but not studying healing. So far, Better Together has held four public meetings with 150 seats each. 600 of the 1.3 million people living across city and county have been allowed to read the chained manuscript to receive communion into the chancellor's cause. They don't want us to know what they don't know. They must fear anything but the abstract truth. Maybe they fear themselves most. Calling the superego, the ego is making the map of the future again. But it's not what, it's how. Again, and again, and again, and again. The chancellor is not a temporally vacuum packed agent of oppression. He follows centuries of the powerful not knowing by knowing, the dominator culture that Bell Hooks has identified. The early French colonial settlers across the river from uh, Washington University thought that the bounds of Cahokia had to be the achievements of a white people, or maybe Toltec people, or maybe Hindu people, but certainly not the savage indigenous Americans they had encountered. Freud says we tend to aggress most severely against our immediate neighbors, right? And so it went until Cyrus Thomas published in the Smithsonian a case, a case that unknown and still unknowable people had built the mounds, Mississippians. The mounds were no longer naturalized ruins, subjects to projected pasts, but something with real and complete material fact. The ignorance of the truth, the ontological heaviness of Cahokia as something to be known only a little more than now has been too much for many white people. They keep retreating to the safer ignorance of authority. They convince themselves that they know the place and they know who lived there, not through their ship, but through some cultural essence. If anyone ever thinks they know what your cultural essence is, run. They probably want your land or your life. 
the Anthropocene is yours if you want it. Now we have the word Anthropocene. We may think we know what time it is. We may think that we have living proof. Or we may be facing a new millenarianism where we whisper a word that what we hope absolves us, resolves us, reshapes us, makes the planetary moment something that fundamentally is about our own capacity for reform. Or we may be in denial. Or we may have realized the lie of liberal democracy has finally overtaken any of its supposed truth, a long, painful eclipse. Latour writes that humans aren't up to the challenge of now because they think that the root cause of root passage through this era revolves around Anthropos instead of Planetus. We see the signs, detect the waves, and then see ourselves as central again. We are great at aiming to know in order to end up not knowing in profound ways. Can it be another way? And does it matter? Is it possible that when we talk about the Anthropocene, when we read the landscape for evidence of catastrophic forces, that fundamentally we are looking for a new politics? Politics will always be a human pursuit, and it is within politics that we study landscapes like St. Louis and the American Bottom, and within politics that we either let these places speak us, or we choose to speak them in new ways. But speech is an act, acts come from power, and power is knowledge. To act differently, we must know differently. We must want different things. Yet politics, without a systems consciousness, without a dedicated understanding of the things that make the things, the how that we've managed to perpetuate as we study its affect, that may be no politics at all. Withdrawal, another human thing, tried and true. Is it any wonder that anarchism seems to lure more young American artists today than communism? and you can throw tomatoes in there. <laughs> a part, a part, a part of what? Tourists always found, or human always lost but alone? Track your pollution, make a log of your knowing, and map the landscape that you make every day. There is your own Anthropocene, right there on the scale that you produce and that you can undo. What on that map don't you like and how will you change it? Thank you.